You are listening to Sander Can, March to Oblivion, researched, written and narrated by Mark Felton, on War Stories with Mark Felton. An angry roar erupted from the massed Australian prisoners of war as their commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Alf Walsh, his hands bound tightly behind his back, was frog-marched by Japanese soldiers over to a wooden post and secured to it. Japanese guards levelled their long bayonet-tipped rifles nervously at the hundreds of prisoners who had taken a few rebellious steps forward towards their commander. Captain Susumi Hoshijima, the camp commandant, smacked Walsh hard across his face with the back of his hand, and a hastily assembled firing squad noisily cocked their rifles. Just minutes before this ugly scene had unfolded, the assembled prisoners had witnessed the strutting Japanese commandant mount a small platform before them, and order an interpreter to shout out the following order that all prisoners were expected to adhere to. 1. We abide by the rules and regulations of the Imperial Japanese Army. 2. We agree not to attempt to escape. 3. Should any of our soldiers escape, we request that you shoot them to death. Following this exhortation, Lieutenant Colonel Walsh mounted the platform and addressed his men. The Japanese are demanding that I, on behalf of you all, sign this statement. Pausing dramatically under the boiling tropical sun, Walsh squared his shoulders and announced in a loud and determined voice, I am not ordering anyone to do anything, but I for one will not sign such a document. The prisoners' chorus of approval was abruptly terminated by Hoshijima's violent attack on their commander. This extraordinary scene had been caused by the escape of 12 Australian prisoners from the camp shortly after their arrival at a place that is today synonymous with cruelty and death, Sandakan. Between May and August 1945, the Japanese forced nearly 3,000 emaciated and diseased British and Australian POWs to walk out of three camps that had been established years before outside the small town of Sandakan in the northeast of Borneo. Their Japanese guards systematically and deliberately butchered the Allied prisoners during three large death marches into the island's rugged jungle interior. The Japanese shot anyone who was unable to keep up with the marching columns. It was a war crime of such magnitude that it stands today alongside the Bataan Death March in the Philippines as indicative of the wartime Japanese military's contempt for the lives of prisoners. This ugly endnote to the imprisonment of Allied POWs on Borneo has naturally largely overshadowed the story of the Sandakan camps before the massacres. And in this first episode, this is what we will address. This story has also largely overshadowed the courage that was displayed by a small group of Australian prisoners, who were led by one of the most determined and unbreakable prisoners that the Japanese possessed, a man who paid the ultimate price for his heroic resistance to the enemy under the most trying of conditions. The Japanese turned the huge island of Borneo into a giant prison for Allied POWs and civilians. There were camps at Batu Lintang, Kuching, Sarawak, Jesselton and Sandakan, and briefly on Labuan Island. A fundamentally humane and decent Japanese officer was placed in overall charge, the rather rotund and affable Lieutenant Colonel Tatsuji Suga. The civilian internees at Batu Lintang camp, where Suga was headquartered, proclaimed him to be a civilised man, and much of his genuine concern for his prisoners appeared to stem from his conversion to Roman Catholicism. In the long and horrific story of Japanese POW camps, a man such as Suga was a rare beast indeed, although Suga's personality and beliefs appeared to run contrary to commonly held stereotypes of the brutal and sadistic Japanese camp commandant. Many of his subordinates were unfortunately psychotic lunatics and raving nationalists who inflicted appalling suffering upon their prisoners. Suga was based at the Joint POW Civilian Internment Centre at Batu Lintang, far away from the main concentration of Allied POWs at Sandakan. 
His physical distance from the three camps at Sandakan probably meant that he could exercise very little control over his subordinate officers. In command at Sandakan was Captain Susumi Hoshijima, an officer with a distinct penchant for brutality, sadism, and irrationality in equally disturbing measure. Captain Hoshijima's greatest nemesis was about to arrive at Sandakan. Lionel Matthews was a 29-year-old decorated captain in the Australian Army Signal Corps from Norwood, a suburb of Adelaide. Matthews would prove to be a considerable thorn in the side of the Japanese, and a man for whom the words never surrender could have been his motto. Matthews had first arrived in Singapore on Valentine's Day 1941, as part of Major General H. Gordon Bennett's much-vaunted 8th Australian Division. The brown-haired, blue-eyed former department store salesman, who sported a neatly trimmed moustache, quickly impressed his superiors during the Battle of Gemas, one of the bloody engagements fought by the Australians during the retreat down the Malay Peninsula. Then Lieutenant Matthews went out under heavy Japanese artillery and mortar fire to restore communications between his brigade headquarters and its subordinate units. He climbed a pole and held together wires to get a central message through. He did it several times a day, recalled his son David. The Japanese would be sniping at him, aiming at him with machine gun fire. But they still didn't get him. He also succeeded in laying cable over ground strongly patrolled by the enemy, and thus restoring communication between his divisional HQ and the HQ of a brigade at a critical period. Awarded the Military Cross, Matthews was promoted to captain in January 1942. Captured when General Percival surrendered Singapore in February 1942, Matthews was initially imprisoned at the infamous Changi Camp, the vast holding centre for Percival's shattered and demoralised Malaya command. Back in Australia, his wife Lorna and young sons heard little of his activities, or his ultimate fate until 1945. On the 8th of July 1942, the first large movement of prisoners to Borneo was made when Force B was shipped out of Changi camp by the Japanese authorities. It consisted of 1,500 fit and healthy Australians, under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Walsh, the 2nd 10th Field Regiment Royal Australian Artillery. They were sent by ship to Sandakan in the colony of British North Borneo. Lieutenant Rod Wells recalled his first sight of Sandakan from the transport ship. From the sea it's lovely, with the red chalk hills on the side of Berhila Island. It really is impressive. I suppose for a split moment we thought, with a sigh of relief, that here is some beautiful, peaceful land where there may not be any Japanese. Wells and his comrades were soon disabused of such notions once they had landed. Captain Hoshijima had overseen the building of three camps at Sandakan. When they arrived, Force B was imprisoned inside Camp 1. They had been brought to Borneo to complete a specific task, to help Japanese engineers construct two airstrips, aircraft dispersal areas, and a system of supply roads through the thick jungle. The work was hard and difficult, and the Japanese were hard taskmasters. The typical working day began at 7.30am and continued through to 5.30pm in an enervating heat. Initially, the prisoners were properly fed and the guards largely refrained from physically abusing them. We had it easy for the first 12 months. We used to get flogged but we had plenty of food and cigarettes, recalled Private Keith Bottrill, the 2nd 19th Australian Infantry Battalion. We actually had a canteen in the prison camp. It was a good camp. The fact that only six prisoners died during the first year at Sandakan testifies to the hands-off approach of the Japanese. The eleven members of Force B who managed to slip away from Sandakan just after their arrival from Singapore do not manage to remain free for long. Splitting up into two parties, one group of six men took refuge deep in the jungle in an abandoned timber cutter's hut. Officers at the camp had provided the groups with what they could spare in the way of escape kit, some tin rations, anti-malarial medicines and a compass, but few rated their chances. 
They were thousands of miles behind Japanese lines, and their white faces would stick out like sore thumbs among the native population, which was itself of unknown loyalty. They also faced a compendium of horrible tropical diseases that festered in the jungle and soon weakened even the healthiest Allied prisoners. The group in the jungle eventually began to run short of food, and they were forced to risk recapture by going to a Chinese farmer's house and asking for help. Fortunately for them, the farmer was no friend of the Japanese, and he directed the desperate SKPs to the home of a Mr. Phillips, a member of the local resistance and a manager of the North Borneo Timber Company. Four Australians turned up on his doorstep. Phillips knew that getting these malnourished and ill Australians out of Borneo and to Allied lines was an almost impossible undertaking, and hiding them risked the chance of discovery by the Japanese and the compromising of a carefully built-up clandestine resistance organisation. Phillips, faced with a terrible decision, felt that he had no choice but to turn in the SKPs to the Japanese to save the lives of his network. A local villager who probably similarly feared awful reprisals against his people if Allied prisoners were discovered hiding in his village turned in the other two sick Australians. The Japanese Kempei Tai military police quickly collected the prisoners and sent them all to Sandakan jail. The other group of five Australians fared a little better, managing to remain on the run for an astounding five months, which was no mean feat considering the terrible hazards that they faced. Another Chinese had caught them stealing vegetables from his garden, and he put them in touch with the resistance, who fed them and also secured for them a small boat. The POWs intended to sail the boat all the way back to Australia. Unfortunately, the season and the tides were against them, and the boat ended up stuck on a mud bank close to shore shortly after they launched themselves on their daring voyage. Fearing discovery by Japanese patrols, the Australians swam back to land, but they were observed by local villagers, some of whom were not friendly. The Kempei Tai offered cash rewards to those locals who turned in Allied escapers alive, and for extremely poor natives, it was tempting to cooperate with their new masters. The Australians, all of them sick with beriberi and malaria, were sent for a trial at the Bornean capital Kuching. Fortunate not to be sentenced to death, the men were given prison sentences and transported to the notoriously harsh Outram Road Jail in Singapore to serve out their punishments. The Japanese soon required more labourers and housed them inside the two empty camps at Sandakan. The POWs were shipped in from Changi and elsewhere. In April 1943, a group of 776 British prisoners arrived at Camp 2 in two parties from Jesselton, now Kota Kinabalu, the largest settlement in Sabah province. Compared to the Australians, the British prisoners were in poor physical condition after a long and convoluted journey from Changi. The fittest 206 British prisoners arrived on the 8th of April, with the rest, totalling 570, arriving in camp on the 18th. Out of the second party, 240 men were very sick with malnutrition and tropical diseases. Captain Hoshijima expressed no particular interest in their predicament and ordered that they were crowded into wooden huts, 74 men to each native building. At the same time that the British arrived at Sandakan, a group of Formosan Chinese guards from Taiwan arrived, brutal little men who despised the Japanese almost as much as they hated the POWs. Taiwan was a Japanese colony, and the locals had been forced to adopt Japanese names and speak the Japanese language. The Japanese treated the Formosan soldiers as their inferiors. In such face based cultures as those in Japan and China, the humiliation and impotent fury felt by the Formosans towards their overlords found expression in their appalling treatment of the only people lower than themselves, the prisoners in their charge. The new Formosan guards took to delivering mass beatings of POW work details under the flimsiest of pretexts. My gang would be working all right and then would be suddenly told to stop, the men would then be stood with their arms outstretched horizontally, shoulder high, facing the sun without hats, recalled Warrant Officer First Class Hector Bill Stikpevich of the Royal Australian Army Service Corps. 
The guards would form themselves into two groups, one group covering the prisoners with their rifles, and the others doing the actual beating. They would walk along the back of us and smack us underneath the arms, across the ribs and on the back, said Stickwivich. They would give each man a couple of bashes. They whimpered or flinched. They would get a little more. Hoshijima also delighted to introducing medieval tortures as punishment for small transgressions of his rules. The commandant ordered the construction of a special place of torture to punish offenders known to the prisoners as the cage. It was placed next to a large tree in Camp 1 and was a wooden structure with iron bars on all sides. Prisoners were forced to sit at attention inside the cage all day long and no bedding or mosquito netting was provided. Private Keith Bottrill experienced this horror first hand. The time I was in for 40 days, there were 17 of us in there. No water for the first three days. On the third night, they'd force you to drink till you were sick. For the first seven days, you got no food. On the seventh day, they started feeding you half-camp rations. Every evening, we would get a bashing, which they used to call physical exercise. The last camp at Sandakan, Camp 3, was finally filled in June 1943, when a fresh group of POWs was shipped in. Known as Force E, it consisted of 500 Australians direct from Changi, and the men were generally in good condition. The Australians had been transported alongside 500 British prisoners. But at Kuching, the Britons had been transferred to local camps, while the Australians had been sent directly to Sandakan. The Kuching camps were appallingly badly run and supplied, and the guards constantly terrorised and assaulted the prisoners. In this camp, for greeting a passing Indian prisoner, he was beaten about the face with a hoe handle, knocked down a number of times and kicked in the lower regions and in the stomach whilst on the ground, so read a post-war report detailing the treatment of one British officer, Lieutenant Stephen Day. He was then taken before Colonel Suga and sentenced to five days' imprisonment in the cells. Lieutenant Colonel Edmund Shepherd, 2nd 10th Field Ambulance, Australian Army Medical Corps, was a camp doctor at Kuching. He later recorded that between the 1st of January and the 31st of August 1945, a staggering 380 Allied prisoners died of deficiency diseases. Many had also been hospitalised by the brutal beatings that they had received. Colonel Shepherd was himself beaten. According to post-war testimony, Bashings of prisoners took place at a rate of 10 a day. Japanese doctor Yamamoto personally bashed and kicked me and other medical officers, including a woman medical officer. Japanese propaganda was keen to show the world that the camps were being well run. Thus a load of bananas were brought into camp, photographed, and then removed from the camp. Such cynical displays were repeated all over the occupied territories by heartless Japanese camp commandants. At Sandakan, Lionel Matthews did not view his circumstances as a reason to stop fighting the Japanese. Within a harsh and terrifying environment, Matthews began to create an organisation that would eventually pose a serious threat. Captain Hoshijima strictly forbade any communication between the three camps, and anyone who disobeyed this order was severely punished. Matthew's first task was to break Hoshijima's prohibition on inter-camp communication by setting up a secret network. He also began to address the central problems that were faced by the POWs, namely a lack of medicines to treat the various tropical diseases that stalked them more efficiently than their guards, as well as a shortage of food. Matthew's efforts in smuggling food into the camps through his contacts with locals went some way to alleviating the chronic malnutrition. Matthews could only do this by building up contacts with the world beyond the perimeter fence, a decidedly dangerous undertaking as he never knew for sure who could be trusted and who could have turned them over to the Japanese in return for cash. The Japanese allowed Matthews to command a small group of prisoners who were permitted outside unsupervised by guards to collect nuts. A grove of palm oil trees behind the local police station became Matthew's connection point to the local underground resistance movement. 
the police put Matthews in touch with local British doctor Jim Taylor, one of several doctors and dentists that the Japanese had not interned because their skills were desperately needed. Although under close watch, Dr. Taylor risked his life smuggling medicines to the camps, along with another civilian, Mrs. Lillian Funk. This intrepid lady had wisely converted some of her assets to gold, pearl, foreign currency, and gemstones just before the Japanese had captured Sandakan, and she had sewn these valuables into the hems of her clothes. She sold what she needed to purchase food and medicines for the POWs, and also maintained a link with Philippine guerrillas. These supplies not only kept up the morale and courage of the prisoners, but which undoubtedly saved the lives of many. Matthews organized a group of 20 trusted officers and NCOs at the camp into an ad hoc intelligence gathering group. Using sympathetic local intermediaries among the indigenous population, Matthews' group made contact with British civilians being held in an internment camp on nearby Bahara Island. Natives often entered the camps to perform various menial chores, and British and Australian working parties outside the camps also had contact with locals. Matthews was playing an extremely dangerous game, for all it took was one informer and his entire organisation would be blown to the Japanese, with terminal consequences for all those involved. At the civilian camp on Bahara Island was Charles Smith, the former governor of British North Borneo. Smith immediately realised the value of Captain Matthews' intelligence work, and he appointed him secretly to command the North British Armed Constabulary, a native police force that remained in operation under Japanese control. Many of its officers and men remained secretly loyal to the British. In great danger, he organised that body in readiness for a rising against the Japanese, and also organised a movement among the loyal native population of Sandakan for a similar purpose. Many locals were of Chinese descent, and their treatment by the Japanese was harsh and discriminatory, engendering great hatred and loathing. Many were happy to help the British war effort if it meant an end to the Japanese occupation. Matthews, through his local contacts such as Lillian Funk, even gained contact with guerrilla forces in the occupied Philippines. With the help of friendly locals and civilian internees, Matthews built up a dossier of intelligence concerning the organisation and deployment of Japanese forces in North Borneo, their strengths and bases, supply situation and details about the local geography. Matthews intended to pass all of this valuable information on to the Allies, in the hope that it would assist them in eventually liberating Borneo. The gathering and caching of firearms was another of Matthews' efforts, the intention eventually being to launch an insurrection against the Japanese, most probably timed to coincide with an Allied invasion of the island. Matthews' group needed information about the progress of the war, so using their network, they managed to smuggle radio parts into their camp and constructed a simple wireless receiver. It was a mission fraught with danger, but two Australian officers, Lieutenant Rod Wells and Lieutenant Gordon Wainton of the Australian Signal Corps, put together the crystal detector, valves and headphones. The job of getting a signal on the basic wireless took weeks of effort, but one day, through the crackling static, came a familiar English public school voice that confidently announced, This is the BBC. It was the voice of freedom. Barely able to contain their excitement, Matthews ordered the delicate set wrapped in a waterproof ground sheet and carefully hidden inside an unused latrine pit. A system of nocturnal radio monitoring was set up, whereby news was carefully written down by the listeners and then distributed to the POW officers, who in turn passed it on verbally to their men. Morale was raised considerably. Captain Matthews knew that it was important to demonstrate to the locals that the war was turning against the Japanese, so as to secure their continued support for his secret activities. Russ Ewan was tasked with passing the latest bulletins to the resistance, one of the contact points being the local constabulary station. The police station was the contact for me. I would report each day to Lionel. 
If he had anything to be taken out of the camp, I would take it, recalled Ewan. The risk of being caught on one of these missions did not bear thinking about. Ewan would most probably have been horribly tortured by the Kempe Tai and then shot if caught red-handed with such inflammatory material. It usually was the news, said Ewan, of the packages that Lionel gave him, and it was rolled up tightly in a wad of paper sealed with sealing wax. When we came to the police station, I would just nod my head, and the police sergeant, Sergeant Avin, who I'd met, would just watch my hand and I would open it and drop the news. He would pick it up afterwards. This operation went smoothly, but the news of the progress of the war that they heard from the BBC emboldened Matthews to pursue another plan that unfortunately proved to be his undoing. Any uprising that was going to be made by the remaining fit prisoners, the members of the constabulary and other sympathisers needed to be carefully timed. Matthews knew the prisoners needed a radio transmitter so they could communicate directly with the Allies as their current wireless set could only receive signals. The process of smuggling the parts into the camp appeared to go smoothly, but the fundamental weakness of Matthews' organisation was the large number of people involved outside of the wire. Unfortunately, one of the Chinese sympathisers involved in procuring the radio parts Zhou Ming was betrayed to the Kempei Tai by a disgruntled contact during the course of black market negotiations at one of the local airstrips. The Kempei Tai moved with their customary swiftness to try and discover the extent of the resistance organisation and brutally tortured Ming and his family until they broke and started naming names. For Matthews and some of his men, the game was up. He had long known the terrible risks that he was running, but his sense of duty had outweighed any concerns that he may have had for his own personal safety or survival. He was in a position where he could have escaped on numerous occasions by means of help of an organisation set up by the Chinese, but he declined, electing to remain where his efforts could alleviate the sufferings of his fellow prisoners. The Allied conspirators that had been named by Zhou Ming, including some local men, were removed to Kempeitai headquarters in Kuching. For three long and terrible months, Matthews and his friends were horribly tortured. They endured vicious beatings. The infamous water treatment, where a hose was placed inside the victim's mouth and water pumped in until the victim lost consciousness. They were hung up by the arms for long periods and had their fingernails pulled off with pliers. One of their number, Johnny Funk, whose wife Lillian had sold gold and pearls to buy medicine for the prisoners, recalled the treatment that he received from the Japanese. They had four bungalows which were used for torture rooms. One form of torture was to make you kneel on a plank, specially carved like spikes. They then placed a heavy plank between the knees, and two Japanese got on each and worked it like a seesaw. The Kempei Tai was inventive in the methods it employed. Another torture was carried out by a jiu-jitsu expert. He flung you all around the room. He badly twisted limbs and used his boots freely, said Funk. I was also jammed in a specially constructed chair in a cramped position. For half a day I was whipped around the head. Lieutenant Rod Wells, the 23-year-old Australian who had built the radio receiver, ended up disabled for life following one interrogation session. The interviewer produced a small sliver of wood like a meat skewer, recalled Wells, pushed that into my left ear and tapped it in with a small hammer. I think I fainted some time after it went through the drum. I remember the last excruciating sort of pain, and I must have gone out for some time because I was revived with a bucket of water. Eventually it healed, but of course I couldn't hear with it. I have never been able to hear since. Captain Matthews and the others managed to find the strength to resist all Japanese efforts to make them cough up the names of the other people in their organisation. In the end, all the Japanese had by way of evidence was the crime of possession of an illegal wireless set and some vague notion that the men had been plotting against the occupation forces and distributing news bulletins. Matthews steadfastly refused to make admissions under brutal torture, including beatings and starvation, to implicate or endanger the lives of his associates, commented the Australian investigation into his fate.
The Kempei Tai arrested and tortured 52 civilians and 20 POWs, accounting for virtually Matthew's entire network and a good proportion the local underground as well. All those arrested ended up in Kuching, where they were sent for trial. Lieutenant Gordon Wainton was found guilty of spreading rumours and sentenced to 10 years imprisonment. Lieutenant Wells received 12 years hard labour to be served in solitary confinement. Both officers were transported to Outram Road Jail in Singapore to serve out their sentences, and this move undoubtedly saved them from the Sandakan death marches in 1945. Both men survived the war more or less in one piece. As for Lionel Matthews, his fate was sealed the moment he was captured. The court sentenced him to death by firing squad. On the 2nd of March 1944, alongside eight of the other ringleaders, Lionel Matthews faced his execution with great courage. He left Australia nearly 16 stone, and he was only 6 stone at the end, said his son David, the father he never knew. Captain Matthews declined a blindfold and looked his Japanese executioners square in the face the moment of his death. He was posthumously awarded the George Cross, the British Empire's highest decoration for gallantry not in the face of the enemy, for his immense courage and resourcefulness in captivity. For those men remaining in the Sandakan camps, their story will be covered in episode 2. You have been listening to Sandakan, March to Oblivion, researched, written and narrated by Mark Felton. For short films on a wide variety of military history topics, visit my other YouTube channel, Mark Felton Productions. You can also help support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.